extreme and so over the top that my mother wouldn't even have believed it was an introduction to me. <laughs> she would have wanted to know who was getting up to speak. Some of the introductions I've had have been very straightforward, very accurate, very right on. Today our speaker is Randy. He is Julie Garris's husband, and, and, <laughs> and I've had that one. But I don't know that I've ever had a tackier introduction. Did you see? Lessons from a scoundrel. It seems a little rude, but since I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and do it anyhow. So. That actually is where we'll be today. One of my favorite stories in all the Bible is that one. I want you to turn to Luke, the 16th chapter. I'm actually going to never feel obligated to stand uh, if, if your health doesn't let you, but honestly, just for the reading of the word, if you're able to stand, would you do so as we go into Luke, the 16th chapter? We begin in the first verse, goes like this. And Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and he asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. My goodness, the guy's heart rate went up like crazy. His blood pressure shot through the roof. I'm about to lose my job. Verse 3, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. You got to put a pause there because he doesn't know what he's going to do. And this guy is awake at four in the morning, walking the floor. I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't dig ditches, and I don't want to stand out in front of Walmart with a cardboard sign. Verse 4, I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. And so he called in each one of his master's debtors, and he asked the first one, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, quick, take your bill, sit down, and make it 450. And then he asked the second, how much do you owe? A, a thousand bushel of wheat, the man replied. He told him, take your bill, make it 800. And then here's the twist. Jesus' stories all have a twist. In fact, when Jesus writes your story, you can pretty well guess there's going to be a twist in it. Jesus doesn't hardly ever take us from point A to point B that he doesn't have a twist somewhere in that sequence. And here's the twist. Verse 8, the master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Let me pray. Father, as we talk about the central point in this parable, a parable with one main point, Lord, we people who hear it, but Father, more than that, people with the boldness and the braveness to act upon it. In the name of Christ, amen. You may be seated. That parable, I know, for many individuals through the years has been a really odd parable. They go, what in tarnation is Jesus doing commending this scoundrel? Well, let me remind you, and most of you know this, Jesus is not commending a scoundrel. Jesus is not saying, I want you to be like this scoundrel in his scoundreling. But what Jesus does do is he points to the bravado of a scoundrel. He points to the creativity of a, of, of a scoundrel. He points to the determination of a scoundrel, and then he turns to his own disciples and asks this question, why in the world can the children of light not show that kind of bravado and that kind of determination and that kind of creativity, not for scoundreling things, but for the things of light, the things that matter? Look at that guy. He applauds not his scoundreling, he applauds his bravado, his creativity. I was talking to dad this weekend, and dad claims he doesn't remember saying this, but dad's getting old and senile, apparently, is all I know with it. <laughs> and he's sitting right there. I pretty well figured I was out of the inheritance already, anyhow. <laughs> dad, whenever we were doing something when I was a kid, it was a little bit delicate. 
a little bit iffy, getting ready to do something that, man, if it didn't happen just right on a piece of machinery or putting something right, something bad was going to go happen. It happened. My dad would kind of turn and wink, and he says, man, this is going to take the nerves of a burglar. <laughs> that was a line he used a lot, actually. It's going to take the nerves of a burglar. There's something about the bravado, the creativity, the passion, something along that line. You never admire the, the behavior of a burglar, but my, the nerves of a burglar. Uh, Thomas Ricca, very forgettable guy, but, but what he did, you go, wow, gee whiz. He, he worked in public works in New Jersey. And in his job of public works, he had a key to the office, but it accidentally let him into the same room that all the meter men and meter maids brought all the quarters and all the machines that the city had, and so quarters. And he worked there for 25 months, Thomas Ricca. And for 25 months, with his key, he would go inside the room they put all the quarters in. And over a 25-month period, he carried out 1.8 million quarters. He had leather boots. He would fill the leather boots to the top of them. It said he kept getting bigger, taller leather boots. He would take his lunch box and he would fill it with quarters. He would put his thermos and he would fill it with quarters. He would take his hat and fill it with quarters. This man stole over $460,000 in 25 months, walking into an office and waddling out as an iron man out to his truck and cashing quarters in. Nobody, nobody would ever compliment Thomas Ricca for his morals, but my, the nerves of a burglar. <laughs> Tanya, Tanya figured out how to forge checks. She figured out how to take her own printer and make a check that looked like it had come from the IRS. It looked so close and so much like a return from the IRS that she did 640 of them. She sold over $2 million by taking IRS return checks to her bank. The IRS never caught it. The federal agency never caught it. But the little bank teller making a minimum wage wondered how this woman could bring 600 And on the 640th, she called somebody. <laughs> I want to remind you... And I, I don't want to say this with any meanness. I, I want it to come across with tenderness. But you realize, don't you, that Jesus said, as long as you are alive, I want you to have the bravado and the creativity and the passion of a burglar. I, I don't want you looking at the nerves of those that are wicked and trying to accomplish wicked purposes. I want you to look and applaud the nerves and the passion and the bravado of those who are pursuing right things. Don't sleepwalk through your life. I don't want to die in my bed watching The Price is Right with a bag of chips in my lap. I want to live large and slay dragons. I want to live a life that when I lived, I used the creativity that I didn't just punch the clock. I, I want to live a life that I didn't just follow the steps that were there. I don't want to be filling out just a bingo card in some way, shape, or form. What I want to be doing is I want to use the imagination God gave me to slay dragons. Slaying dragons has nothing to do with the concept of uh, uh, perhaps uh, Lord of the Rings. But it has a great deal to do that if you read Revelation or anywhere else, the concept is somebody's got to stand beside the innocent. Somebody's got to rescue the broken. Somebody has to care about the lost. Somebody has to be with them with the well. Somebody has to be calling Zacchaeus out of a tree. Somebody's got to be out of their sleepwalk and their creativity. And Jesus points to a scoundrel and he said, oh, if just the children of light had that kind of thing. Eugene Ormandy was the director of the Philadelphia Philharmonic. And they said one time while directing, he dislocated his arm, threw it from its socket. The guy who I was reading said, I don't think I even displaced my tie in serving Jesus. At some point in time, the call is, are you living large enough? Jesus himself drives this point. Here's a character in the Old Testament. I, he just fascinates me. His name's Beniah. You almost beep as you go by it. Some of you will know who Benaiah is. Most of you probably would not. I, I wouldn't have automatically. Benaiah is one of, of, of David's mighty men. And it introduces Benaiah this way. Mark uh, Batterson actually wrote a book um, entitled uh, With, a, with a, a Lion in a Pit on a Snowy Day. Uh, what? That's scripture. Uh, Benaiah... 
Benaiah is a guy, and he kills a couple of Egyptians, it tells us. But, but he's known for this, that he chases a lion into a pit on a snowy day and kills it with his hands. Okay? Now, you and I have seen enough cartoons. We know how this goes. Man runs, lion chases him. This is a cartoon goes all the way. Lion runs, man chasing him. Okay? The lion goes into a pit. Most people would go, lion in the pit? Boy, that's good. I'm safe now. Finally, lion's in a pit, or the, the lion's safe, or something. And Benaiah dives into the pit. On this cartoon that you're watching, fur's flying, hair's flying, everything's flying. You can't see the bottom of the pit. Just, just, you can see this cartoon, can't you? It's all come flying, and you're expecting a lion to come out in a moment with a smirk on his face. Instead, a Benaiah walks out with a tail over his shoulder, dragging a lion out of a pit. If you read a little bit further about him, David selects Benaiah to be his personal bodyguard and in charge you. Well, duh. <laughs> duh. David's going through, this is Mark Batterson who says this, David's going through the list of resumes for his bodyguard. Jerusalem School of Security, been working at the mall three years. Okay, good. <laughs> Jerusalem School of Security, been at the kindergarten cop for two and a half years. Well, that's good. Chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day. Killed it with my bare hands. That's the guy I want. <laughs> That's the guy I want. There's a sense in which this life that we are, are asked to live is a grand adventure. I'm going to ask, are you having any fun in it? And last spring, it was a, a day that I was left in charge of, 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 of my grandchildren. I think they were three or 13 or something. I don't know how many they were, but anyhow. <laughs> I was doing my, my grandparent duty, and I was over at, at Katie's house, and, and Josh and Katie's over on HH Highway. And um, the kids are out riding bikes. The two older ones are riding bikes. Uh, at that time, there was a second grader and a kindergartner. And then there's a, a, a little boy that just turned three that day, and he was in the four-wheeler going 60 mile an hour, okay? <laughs> And they were going around that house. I mean, they were going around the two little kids on a bicycle and the, and the three-year-old on his, on his four-wheeler. Well, I know the corner of that house, uh, that the uh, north, um, east, or northwest corner of that house, there's a retaining wall and there's a big dip down for the walkout basement. And I walk around and I watch these kids going, you know, 50 mile an hour on these bicycles. And all at once they come to that dip and they're gone. I mean, just go, go in. And then I watch the three-year-old and he comes flying and some of those wheels are coming off the ground. I'm watching and he goes, he goes down. I'm going, what in the world? And so I go over there and they come around and sure enough, they wave at me big and they go over it again. And this, I mean, they just, they're just going, about like going down here. I'm going, what in the world? So I do my grandpa thing. Hey, you guys, that's scary. You, you shouldn't be doing that. That's scary. Kinley, second grade at that time, rolled her eyes. <laughs> she looked at me and she said, Grandpa, because it's scary is why it's fun. <laughs> Really, that is the truth. That is the truth. Are you having any fun in your Christian life, or are you just working an all-night shift? You will not have any fun in your Christian life. You will not have great stories to tell about God. You will not have great stories to tell of the splitting of the Red Sea. You'll have no stories of manna. You'll have no stories of the lame walking. You'll have no great stories of God if you're not taking risk. If it's not scary, you're sleepwalking. And you will miss so many, many things that God had enforced. The great stories all begin with things like Jonathan turning to his armor bearer and going, you know what, there's lots of Philistines, and I don't know, it's just you and I, but perhaps God, perhaps God will act on our behalf today. And he goes and he stands at a cliff with a Philistines all up there and just the two of us down here. And he says, let's see if God will act on our behalf today. And, and you know the story where he and his armor bearer climb up and they climb up and they, they have a story to tell of the majesty of God. You don't get stories to tell of the majesty of God watching the price is right with a bag of chips in your lap. <laughs> Esther, I know Esther had to process a lot of stuff and I know it wasn't easy but at some point in time, Esther came with his answer, if I perish, I perish. 
but it's worth doing. And so when I'm standing here with a bunch of folks, some of you in the last years of your life, and some of you still have 50 years left in your life, you know that. All I would say to you is Jesus points out a guy and says, I want my children to be like that. I want you to have the bravado and creativity and the passion. John, McCart- or John, uh, John Piper uh, wrote a, a book about don't waste your life. And in that book, he talks about the bat boy mentality. He said, you can't be the bat boy. Don't be the bat boy. He said, it's perfectly fine for children somewhere, but it's not right for you to be a bat boy. He said, a bat boy gets the uniform, same uniform as everybody on the team. Bat boy gets a number on his back. Everybody's got a number. So he's got a, he's got a uniform and a number, but he has no smudges on his cheek because he's never at the plate. He has no smudges in the cheek because he dove into second. He has no scars on his leg because he got spikes somewhere, sliding somewhere. He has no bruises because the fastball hit him in the side. He has no grand stories to tell of his own life in the game. All he is is the bat boy handing the bats to other people who are in the game. And John Piper says you'll waste your life if you don't get into the game somewhere. And getting into the game is not complex. Are you living a life worth telling stories about? Until the fear of missing out is greater than the fear of messing up, you'll never have great stories. The fear of messing up has to go way down in our kingdom things, and the fear of missing out has to go very, very high. The secret to life is not accumulating stuff. It's accumulating stories. Make your children and grandchildren sit there forever having to sort through your stories, not your stuff. Accumulating stuff doesn't go anywhere, but accumulating stories make them sit there and wrestle with what stories do we even tell our children and grandchildren about you because there were so many stories to tell. And so I say to you, make sure you throw away the concept that I'm most afraid of messing up. Oh, no. Change that for I'm more afraid of missing out. Cornell University did a study on regret. Their study on regret is, is basically goes like this. At the end of life, everybody has regret. 100% of the people at the end of their life have regret. It's a part of the human experience. But here's what they found that was interesting. 16% of the time, 16% of the regret is for actions taken. 84% of the regret is for opportunities missed. Doors I didn't walk through. Stories I didn't chase, roads I didn't go, phone calls I didn't make. That's why Jesus commends a scoundrel. Got tickled the story of Melody. Melody's a housewife. She was living in a little neighborhood and she knew the neighbors were gone and she saw a guy crawling in the basement window of their house and she knew that didn't look right. So she called the police immediately, but she didn't want the guy to get out. She didn't want him to get away, and so she went over, and she knew the house herself. She'd been in enough. She knew that was about the only window if he's going to come back out the basement. And he popped his head back up to crawl back out, and she picked up rocks, and she started throwing them at him and just tossing rocks. to get. Him. He ducked back in, and, and then she just kept throwing things, and sure enough, he, he stayed in there. Police got there, and they, they caught him, and police officer came and said, ma'am, he said, you did an awful nice job of keeping that guy from getting out of that window. He said, how'd you do it? She said, well, I, I just started throwing rocks as long as I could find rocks. And I said, yeah, I know. What'd you do when you ran out of rocks? Well, I found some pine cones. <laughs> so I was chunking pine cones. and said, yeah, I, I, I realized that. Ma'am, what'd you do when you ran out of pine cones? She said, well, I'm really not sure. What, I, she said, I, I kept throwing stuff. He said, yeah, I know. He said, that explains all the stuffed animals around the, uh, the, uh, <laughs> the window. And she started laughing. She said, well, you're right. I'm a mom. She was chunking Elmo and Daffy Duck and anything else she had that happened to be in the back of her car. And the, her... There's a sense in which you're not held accountable for what you don't have, but you've got to throw what you do have. You've got to throw what you do have. There is a sense in which when I meet with the Lord, he would say, to the angels, come, I want you to meet my servant. She was throwing Daffy Duck and Elmo because that's what she had. Do you see the creativity of my servant? 
write the letter, place the phone call, make the visit, give the money, invite the neighbor, pursue the student, mentor the young man, open your guest room. Living large and slaying dragons is a choice. Living large and slaying dragons won't fall into your lap. You're going to have to get up each day and worship and say, God, where do I chase the lion today into a snowy pit? Where do I chase the dragon? God commends risk takers always. In Matthew 25, you know the story. There's a man who gives to his servants, and he gives to one man five bags, one of his servants five bags to look after. And to another of his servants, he gives him two bags of of money to, to look after. And to one, he gives one bag to look after. And the master comes back, and and when he comes back, you you recognize that the one who had won said, man, I I knew you were majestic. I knew you were powerful. I knew what kind of a man you were, and I wasn't about to take any risk with it. I wasn't going to lose anything. And the master is so upset because, well, you know the story. Trustworthiness means taking risk. In the economy of God, trustworthiness is not a riskless life. It is taking risk. And so I want to say again, write the letter, place the phone call, make the visit, give the money, invite the neighbor, pursue the student, mentor the young man or young woman, open your guest room. Jonathan Edwards, many of you would know that name. Jonathan Edwards is over over 300 years ago. He wrote something for his own life in his latter years. His, his, in his 20s, he wrote, this is the life I want to live, and I want to measure in my older years, did I live this? And he wrote a series of, of, of resolutions. I, I won't go through them all, but let me throw you just a, a couple, three of them. He said, resolution number five. I'm resolved never to squander one moment of time, but improve it the most profitable way I can. Resolution number six, I'm resolved to live with all of my might while I do live. Resolution number 17, I resolve that I will live so as I had wished I had done when it comes to the end of my life. Resolution 22, I am resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can with all the power, might, vigor, vehemence, yea, even violence that I'm capable of. What's he saying? I'm going to read it again here in a second, but he's going, I'm resolved to endeavor to obtain for myself as much happiness in the other world as I possibly can with all the power, might, vigor, vehemence, yea, violence. Violence does not mean, as we hear, the vandalism kind of violence. It's the opposite of the word tame. I don't want to live a tame life. I want to live so that the man 10 minutes into heaven would turn to the man I am now and say, yes, that was the way you should have lived. Every one of us will be somewhere 10 minutes into heaven. And if the man or woman 10 minutes into heaven were to turn and talk to you now, what would the man or woman 10 minutes into heaven say to you? It might be, dear, dear saint, don't live a tame life. Go slay dragons. God bless.